step back, we've, um, our final presentation for this segment is uh, uh, Jeanette Ho. Jeanette Ho, who holds the position of cataloging metadata librarian at Texas A&M University Libraries, where she catalogs monographs and participates in the management of the library's institutional repository, as well as the creation of her unit's policies and documentation for non-marked metadata. Her, her areas of interest include bibliographic control of online and audiovisual resources, and the management and creation of metadata, including linked data, to enhance discovery for resources in catalogs and repositories. Okay, um, I'm going to be talking about some plans that are being made at Texas A&M University um, to develop a app name application or app that will utilize linked data to bring some measure of authority control to our repository. So um, our repository suffers from the same problem repositories everywhere do in that we don't have um, name disambiguation. <laughs> So to John Smith, that you can't tell whether they're saying he's the same person or two separate authors. Wang P, you can't tell just by looking at him whether he, he or she matches any of the existing names that are already represented in the IR. And this is just a screenshot of our author browse index. So you can see it's a common problem. Every few clusters, you see the same issue, that the names are not being entered consistently. But uh, most users will never see that page because, um, as you all know, users tend to rely on keyword searching to pull up um, digital items. So ideally, they should be able to, when they land on a work like this, click on the access, name access point, that circle on the screen, and then get all that person's works in our IR. However, that's not going to be the case if the name is not entered consistently, like without the initial or if it's even misspelled. So how to remedy this situation? Well, in last, uh, last year, we were in the middle of our implementation of what we call our DAME, or Digital, Digital Asset Management Ecosystem. So Texas A&M chose not to um, adopt a single DAMS, or da Digital Asset Management System. Instead, it decided to take the ecosystem approach where it would um, have a networked um, different components with various platforms and different softwares combined to collectively manage, manage it, um, our digital objects. So at this time, a working group was formed because it was decided that since we're implementing this name, it's a good idea to sort of revisit our policies and any unresolved long-standing issues. So this working group was formed to last some, in the summer of 2018 to recommend what is needed for a, what they call a robust name authority system to handle entities in our um, IR. So we were asked to look at standard approaches, um, such as ISNI's, ORCID's, NACO, um, that exist and how we would utilize them, along with the locally minted um, URIs in the system. We were also asked to investigate what would be the technical um, needs for implementing a name application, as well as um, needs in terms of time and effort, and also evaluate the local, our local Vivo instance as a possible solution. Finally, we were asked to prioritize where were the needs what was, the, what was the need for authority control among the various um, possible entities we could include in such a system? So uh, at, the get, at the very outset, we decided we would concentrate on personal names as our first step. So we did eliminate the importance of a system to be able to um, deal with organizations, subjects, and other types of entities. But we decided personal names, especially authors affiliated with Texas A&M, that would be where um, the most pressing need was. And so this is just a summary for the activities of our group. Um, most of it took place during phase one last year. We are in the middle of phase two now. So the first thing we did was do an environmental scan, look at what was published in the literature, um, review the existing standards for authority control, again, focusing on people, because that's what we were dealing with first, and look at the existing solutions that were implemented elsewhere. So we looked at names at the University of North Texas and uh, even visited them. We looked at CEDAR at the University of Houston, and we considered we continued to uh, investigate other solutions. But we also developed a bunch of use cases to sort of clarify what we would like our own app to accomplish. And based on all the dis this and the, the information and discussions we had, we recommended that instead of adopting or adapting as an existing solution elsewhere, we would instead develop our own um, app in-house. And I think there are various reasons for why we chose to do that, but um, I mentioned our, our DAME ecosystem. It has various repositories. We have DSpace, 
Um, we added a Fedora repository, Spotlight, various platforms and things that we continue to add. And we wanted it to be open and flexible as possible so we could customize it according to our needs. Also, um, we didn't want to be locked into using a particular data model that's being used elsewhere. And we also wanted to maximize our in-house expertise. Because a lot of the solutions we looked at used web applications like Django, Ruby on Rails, um, Python, and our expertise of our digital initiatives that they tend to be more um, based on Java. So the app has um, two, three purposes. So it's going to serve, we want it to serve as a tool for the catalogers in the MedBay management unit to manage identities in the day, identify names for cleanup um, for, or that need disambiguation after they're in the IR. And we wanted to serve as a tool for metadata providers um, or the creators to help them more consistently um, select the names that are in the app. And we ultimately, we are doing this for our users to make it easier for them to be able to identify the authors and eventually other entities we decide to include in it. So at a minimum, we were thinking that the app would have a unique identifier, which would be a URI based on a UUID, a canonical form of name, name variants, and links to external sources. And this is just a more detailed list of what we would like our app to do. Again, we're going to make unique URIs um, for each person in our repository. It should be reusable in the various components within our day. Um, Fedora, Avalon Spotlight, and um, possibly even Folio when we eventually implement that to replace our ILS. We would also eventually like to link the URIs for each person with um, their ones for each work that they're associated with. Um, and have it reusable outside of Texas A&M as true linked open data, but that's more um, down the road. So more, our more immediate concern is to get a prototype that's up and running first. So uh, we would like it to be able to search um, various names as well as <coughs> identifiers to answer the question, do I have all this person works just by a form of name? We would like it to utilize the links within the app to link out to external authorities or source, pu sources, pull in contextual data to it, answer the question, is this the person I'm searching for, to help disambiguate them. We would like to, um, again, it's going to be an internal tool for catalogers um, to to figure out um, where, where the need is for cleanup, uh, what names need to be disambiguated. Also, we've met, I mentioned it's going to be a tool for metadata creators. Um, we have actually the vast majority of metadata creators at a are faculty and graduate students. Um, both through Vireo, um, where the graduate students upload their ETD information, as well as Mannequin, our interface for DSpace, or they, uh, they upload their non-ETD works and articles and also enter their own metadata. So what we can do is to have a type ahead that would uh, display a drop-down menu with name strings and we can pull in disambiguating information to help them dis um, select the proper form of name. Also, we have um, metadata, our metadata creators also tend to be our colleagues, that is, um, subject selectors and um, curators that, in the library who don't go through any online user interface. So they tend to um, submit spreadsheets of metadata for batch ingest into um, our repository. So we're going to have to, um, they're probably going to have to have direct access to the app, so we'll have to figure out how to make it user friendly for them as well as for um, us, the people who work, the metadata um, personnel. And our ultimate goal I mentioned is to help our users um, make it easier for them to identify the names of the authors they're looking for and get all that person's works. So ideally, we would also like to have a similar type of header or drop down list in a unifying discovery interface that would um, search all our repositories. But uh, this might be more um, complicated than we think at first because our DANE relies upon solar indexing. So uh, this, is gonna, this is way down the line because we're still getting a discovery interface. But we're thinking ahead and possibly one way is to attach a piece of disambiguating information at the end of a name string, for instance, and, uh, and index that as a text string within Silver. So um, anyway, we're going to have to deal with that down the road. And this is a diagram of how we're envisioning the various components of the, day will work, of the app will work together. So at the, <coughs> top, at the top in the middle is a box labeled initial data feeder. So that would be the first step. It will pull in or harvest data from two sources. One will be a collection from our repository, so there will be some cleanup prior to them. 
and then it will also harvest names from scholars at TAMU, and that's our local Vivo instance. And that, in turn, gets the canonical forms of names for our LDAP-based um, university directory. So pull in the names from these two sources. Where it, if there's a match, it will, um, it will use the canonical form of name from scholars. And then it, in the app, what it will do is it'll admit that you or I, that local um, identifier, the resolver will pull all this information together and sort of flag what are the prob problematic um, names, like the two John Smiths that I mentioned, or maybe it's John Smith and John H. Smith that are mere matches, but it can't tell whether they're the same person. And then the staff, or our librarians from the metadata management unit, the catalogers, will eyeball these um, problematic names and decide, oh, these John Smiths are the same person, so these two identities should be merged, or they're not the same person and they should be split apart. And we'll be aided in this reconciliation task by what they call a data aggregation microservice. And this will link out to the various um, external sources to help us pull in contextual data for this task. And one of the first thing it will link out to will be our local Vivo instance, the scholars database. Other um, things we might add later are, in, are included on the slide, like the Library of Congress name authority file, ISNI, ORCID, VIOP, and Scopus, as well as other ones that we looked at. And these are listed um, in terms of how they were ranked um, initially by the group. And these were the criteria we used to evaluate them, so the most important ones are at the top. So in order for, to be considered um, in the app, the identifiers have to be unique, persistent, compatible with existing naming schemes on the web, and they have to be actionable, that they have to actually resolve to some information that's published on the web. So this is a screenshot of our scholars at TMU Vivo instance. It's, as you can see, it has um, information that might be useful for disambiguation of bio, of affiliations, um, subject areas their, of their research interests, and as well as positions held. ISNI is another source we're considering. So um, Texas a was actually a participant in the PCC ISNI pilot that took place last year. So we have some familiarity with, with what's in there. But that also contains some similar information that might be useful to um, help identify um, a particular author. Some issues that we're either grappling with now or anticipate that we will down the road is should canonical names in the app be unique? Well, we're thinking that at this stage, I think we're leaning to um, where it doesn't necessarily have to be as long as we can display it along with information that's sufficient in um, identifying or disambiguating that name. What contextual data should we use? Well, there's some possibilities I listed in the slide. A lot of it was listed, on, was displayed on the previous screens I just showed you. Also, where will the contextual data come from? I mentioned we were initially going to pull it from scholars and uh, examine other sources um, after that. Another idea we're toying with is to have a metadata field, where if somebody during the reconciliation, reconciliation phase um, sees there's two John Smiths, they can type in free text. Like, this is John Smith from the Department of Chemistry, for instance, and not the one from sociology. And that would be a piece of information that attached or displayed next to the name. Also, what will our user interface look like? So I think that will be down the road um, after once we get this prototype up and running um, for us as well as for the people who will be other people who will be utilizing the app. Uh, I also mentioned that can, the canonical form is initially going to come from scholars, our local Vivo instance. What about the people who are not in scholars? Um, we're going to have to deal with that. Should we privilege some sources over the other? Like, should we look? to see whether they have a name authority record, for instance. What will we do if they do not? And so that's something we're going to have to deal with. Also, how will the app interact with the public? So I mentioned some of the issues we're anticipating with solar. So another question might be, are people going to find the contextual information that is pulled in from those um, links useful? So would it be useful, for instance, to have a link to a knowledge card in addition to uh, display the, the variant forms of name? Also, how to deal with name changes, and so um, we could, uh, if somebody gets married, for instance, um, do we treat them as a name bearing? Do we admit a new identity for them? Um, also, how, but how are we going to deal with organizations, and should we treat the, uh, them the same as people? So our immediate next step is to develop a working prototype. So we anticipate it's going to be up sometime this summer, but it's not going to, we know it's definitely not going to be before July. 
In the meantime, we've pre-selected some low-hanging fruit collections where the names are more or less guaranteed or very likely to be in scholars. So they tend, these tend to be current faculty publications as well as current theses and dissertations where they might have served as advisors. So once the app is ready, uh, we'll run, we'll, clean, we'll have cleaned up these names using Open Refined to you know, get rid of the obvious things like period versus not period at the end of initial, run them through the app, analyze results to see what are the problems with it, um, what are the things that need to be improved, and it, very importantly, look at what are the proportion of, the act that, of names that actually need human review and reconciliation. What types of problems occur, um, how frequently do they pop up, and uh, what are the implications in terms of time and staffing for our, our med local um, metadata management unit. And in the future, we hope to also test other collections that are, pose more challenges, including the ones I mentioned, where the names are not in scholars and historical deceased persons whose names might not even be in any of these external authorities. Should, what, we're going to be, what are we going to use to disambiguate them, and should we even bother? Also, we want to explore how information on the app will look on the human readable side again, and uh, we want to also plan how to deal with legacy data, because we've already get, really got tons of um, digital objects already within our DSpace repository. So clean, cleaning up will be a long-term effort, and so we're going to probably do this on a collection-by-collection -collection basis, so we'll have to figure out how to prioritize that as well. And also, I mentioned our eventual goal is to be able to co connect these um, local URIs with their works in the IR and have it um, available for other institutions, for other people to use as um, linked open data. Uh, but that's much further down the line. And we also want to eventually move on to other entities in the app besides um, people, um, including organizations. These can be departments, colleges, or centers. and institutes that are affiliated with Texas A&M, and we might also look at other types of entities, like such as subjects, or even geographical names, for instance. But um, we want to take, a pers take care of personal names first. So um, that's just a summary of um, what we're planning right now. Um, so I welcome any questions or even suggestions or advice on, on, um, based on your experience, and if you want to contact me after the conference, my email address is at the bottom of the slide. So that was amazing. Um, uh, we have uh, about, um, I think, 20, 25 minutes uh, left for questions, um, and uh, all of our speakers are here and available to answer them. Uh, and we've got Patty running around with a microphone for anybody who needs it. This is a question for Jeanette. My name is Leo. Um, pulling from LDAP as opposed to how people actually publish, um, particularly with journal articles and so forth, um, have you run into the difficulty of compound surnames um, from a publication perspective versus what the HR people in their LDAP systems and system using as a single surname? I, I have female students and faculty who go by maiden name, husband's surname compound when they publish to retain the, the trajectory of their careers, but HR doesn't believe them. Um, um, no, we haven't yet. Um, we might, but when we start testing this, so that's an interesting issue that's good to be aware of. You will run into it. <laughs> So I've got a, it's a broader question for everybody. Um, I was sort of struck in listening to all the presentations about this idea of sharing. So it's great in the LinkedIn world to be able to share the work that you've done. And uh, I think it was Eric and Jeanette are sort of more focused locally. They're creating identifiers locally for local people. Um, Sarah has sort of, it's sort of 50-50. If it's somebody has more national importance, do something more nationally, otherwise do it locally. Um, Joy has done things sort of in Wikidata, so it's sort of it's it's international to start up with. So it's all very different approaches. Um, so I just like to hear more about your concept of thinking through about sharing, because you know I'm thinking about faculty at MIT, they might go to Caltech or Stanford, uh, and I 
hard to break them in. Somebody in a repository, it's probably from a journal article, it was the last name first initial, you figure out who it is. I would love to be able to know that you figured it out because it would be really valuable for me and my work. So just that whole idea of sharing in the broader context.